What do British World War II fighter pilots have in common with 3.5 million American children? What does renowned visual artist Andy Warhol have in common with one in six US college students? The answer will surprise you. Join me as we look at the drugs prescribed to people with ADHD today. An interesting story about how the same and similar drugs have shaped wars, the arts, and big pharma throughout history, and more recently, in our education systems. Today, the legal prescription of this category of drugs is a $13 billion industry. But why is there such a huge demand for their production? How do they affect the workings of our brain? And is there a more sinister side to these medications? This video has been made for and made by the enthusiastic women looking to shed a little bit more light on a disorder and drugs that have sculpted human history. My name's Lewis McSporran, and this video has been made for your eyes only. Before we can understand the type of drugs that are used to treat ADHD, we need to take a quick look at the chemistry within our very brains and decipher what's happening between the ears. It is now well documented that those with ADHD have a lower supply of dopamine than neurotypical individuals. Years of studies have shown that the main ADHD symptoms derive from a different wiring in our right dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. This area of the brain controls our executive functions. The underdevelopment or damage to this area can cause impulse control issues, an inability to focus on tasks, and a difficulty with emotional regulation. This brain area and its executive functions are controlled by dopamine levels, and without enough, you lose the ability to regulate them. Attention deficit is in fact a dopamine deficit. If we're able to increase the dopamine levels in the prefrontal cortex of those with ADHD, we are temporarily able to reduce their symptoms. This can be done with stimulant medication. Stimulants make up the majority of drugs prescribed to those with ADHD, and it's a study of their pros, cons, and the unfortunate abuse of these stimulants that will help us assemble the bigger picture of the ADHD drug industry. Our timeline begins in June 1929 with American chemist Dr. Gordon Alley's in his lab whilst attempting with no avail to improve a drug called ephedrine. Ephedrine was and still is a popular biodilator, often used to treat asthma, colds, and also prevent low blood pressure during anesthesia. Instead, Ali's synthesized something very different. He called it beta-phenyl isopropylamine, but it would later be named amphetamine. On June 3rd, he tested his new creation on himself in a rather large 50 ml dose, and well, he liked it. He documented a feeling of well-being. His mood was enhanced, his blood pressure increased, and when inhaling, his nose was dry and clear. At a dinner party later that evening, he recorded an increased mental sharpness and an unusual sense of wit. The main recorded downside was just rather sleepless night. Minds seemed to run from one subject to another. Self-testing was common practice back in the early days of drug creation. Who better to test the effects than the trained individuals who knew most about it. In this particular instance, the effects were euphoric and he knew that whatever he had discovered would surely be of use to the public for something. But what? Unknown to Allies at the time, the first amphetamine was in fact originally developed in 1887 by a Roman chemist, Lazar Edleani. But for over 40 years, chemists had regarded it as pharmaceutically useless. However, Allies took a very different approach. After testing his creation with asthmatic patients in the hope that it would reveal similar or better results than existing ephedrine, it became quickly apparent that it was not an effective treatment for respiratory conditions after all. With this, he set off to find a new use for it. A 1932 US patent declared him the inventor of phetamine sulfate and ephetamine hydrochloride, covering a patent claim in their use as a medicine. Ali's engaged in a partnership with Philadelphia-based pharmaceutical firm Smith Klein and French, and from this, a new customer product emerged, Benzedrine. A small nasal inhaler prescribed to clear block sinuses, treat narcolepsy, and help with appetite suppression. It was extremely popular, but less for its congestion relief and more for its euphoric effects. Users quickly realized that the sulfate salts inside the readily available inhalers had a strong feel-good effect. 
Knowing its potential, both good and bad, Smith, Klein & French bought the rights of amphetamine in 1934 from Alice and in early 1937 began to push a pill form of these sulfate salts. Backed with the already well-known brand name of Benzedrine, their new product, Benzedrine Sulfate, was granted permission by the American Medical Association in December 1937 as a new prescription medication for narcolepsy, Parkinson's, and mild depression, creating the first prescription antidepressant. It was in the same year, whilst thousands of doctors were prescribing the pills for their use in improving mood, that Charles Bradley first prescribed the pills to one of his patients with attention deficit disorder. It was effective, but it was effective across many conditions. Their nickname, Pep Pills, gathered immense publicity and were to become routinely used in treatment for obesity, chronic pain, libido issues, mental fatigue, and even hangovers. At this time, college students even began using Pep Pills to increase their productivity. The newly marketed confidence drug, unsurprisingly, went on to play a large role in the Second World War. During World War II, British military doctors began handing out Benzedrine to the pilots to overcome fatigue and sustain mental efficiency. Amphetamines boosted morale and mood throughout the war, encouraging the much needed fighting spirit. Although the pills almost had zero impact on cognitive function, the surge of that famous feel-good effect likely set aside any negative ideas about their own abilities. The soldiers likely felt almost superhuman. 72 million Benzedrine tablets were supplied by a department of the UK government called the Ministry of Supply to aid the war effort. Once the US military caught wind of this, they rushed along their tests and studies with the drug. And by 1943, a package of Benzedrine pills was standard issue in the emergency kit of every American bomber pilot. You won't be surprised to learn, at the same time, a Berlin-based pharmaceutical company began employing a similar tactic. They used a chemically similar drug, methamphetamine, and distributed it under the name Pervitin. But on the front lines, it was better known as tank chocolate, or Stuka tablets, meaning dive bomber tablets. German forces used a focused surprise attack method of warfare during the war called Blitzkrieg, meaning lightning war. Their vicious tactic leveraged air warfare, tanks, heavy artillery, and troop deployment in rapid and unpredictable attacks. The first three months of Blitzkrieg aggression was supported by 35 million tablets of methamphetamine. Pervitin and similar methamphetamine drugs were used by the frontline troops all the way up to the commanders of war. Meth played a huge role within Hitler's army and eventually on der Führer himself. The use of the drug on both sides of the war was used effectively to motivate troops during horrendous conditions and to dull empathy while creating and witnessing unthinkable bloodshed. Better to feel the side effects of Pervitin than be dead. Shortly after the war, the British weighed up the positive and negative effects of these stimulant drugs and decided the cost was too great on the health of the troops to continue using them. However, the American military continues to use amphetamine to this day and has used them as recently as the conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan. The addictive trend continued well after the war. The drugs delivered a much desired energy kick and confidence to businessmen looking to work hard and grow their wealth. They offered the housewife a way to feel good about doing the housework and to stay slim to keep their war hero husband happy. And to philosophers and writers looking to explore their consciousness, it opened doors to new questions and provided focus and deep thoughts. Advertising ramped and the easily prescribed drugs soared in popularity. Who put the bands of dream in Mrs. Murphy's old team? Where did she get that stuff? Now she just can't get enough. Thank you. Hi, Marie. Hello, Mr. Holmes. Hi. Just a cup of coffee, please. Really, Mr. Holmes, a hard-working executive like you should have a hot lunch. Very well, just scrambled me a couple of Benzedrine tablets. <laughs> At its height, 50 amphetamine-based pills per man, woman, and child in the US were produced by Big Pharma per year. And it wasn't just the working class that were being targeted. Dr. Max Jacobson, a German-born American physician, was President John F. Kennedy's doctor of choice. He also went by names such as Dr. Feelgood and Miracle Max, accredited to his prescription of vitamin shots, which he claimed had tissue-regenerating properties. 
His prescriptions really took off. His fanatical patients raved about them. And it wasn't long after his immigration to the US that Dr. Feelgood Jacobson found himself rubbing shoulders with Hollywood stars, eventually being called upon to treat President Kennedy's ailments in 1960. Unknown to many, Kennedy was a very sick man. He had Addison's disease, which is a failure of the adrenal glands. And among other health problems, he had a herniated disc removed in 1944. He was desperate and Miracle Max and his vitamin injections helped his pain. When questioned about the contents of the medication he was being given, Kennedy famously replied, I don't care if it's horse piss, it's the only thing that works. It was uncovered later that the miracle shots that Kennedy swore by and later became dependent on contained highly addictive amphetamines, painkillers, and even animal hormones. Dr. Feelgood was also known to have treated Marilyn Monroe, Elvis Presley, and many, many more celebrities. His patients would come knocking at his home office at all hours, demanding prescriptions, and he eventually resorted to distributing to go vials with disposable needles allowing for self-injections. Another unsurprisingly popular doctor at the time, Dr. Robert Freeman, was another German-born physician prescribing the popular shots laced with amphetamines to his celebrity clientele. He's thought to be the infamous doctor the Beatles based their song on, Dr. Robert. You're a new and better man. He helps you to understand. He does everything he can, Dr. Robert. If you're down, he'll pick you up, Dr. Robert. Dr. Freeman also published a 1983 autobiography titled, What's so bad about feeling good? During the same period, a weight loss drug called Obitrol, containing mixed amphetamine salts, was a stimulant drug of choice by New York-based creative Andy Warhol, his addiction fueling his extreme visual spectacles. The drugs became a daily ritual for Warhol and the circles he moved in. His second book, released in 1968, A, a novel, consisted of a 24-hour recorded transcript between himself and actor Odin, Warhol's renowned chatterbox superstar and stimulant drug user. The small A in the title standing for amphetamine. Things were about to change. The US drug crackdown descended at the beginning of the 1970s. The violently negative health implications associated with addiction to amphetamines and similar stimulants was apparent both in US city streets and on the front lines of the Vietnam War. The later labeled War on Drugs ensued following President Nixon's 1971 speech. America's public enemy number one in the United States is drug abuse. If we're going to have a successful offensive, we need more money. This is one area where we cannot have budget cuts because we must wage what I have called total war against public enemy number one in the United States, the problem of dangerous drugs. No drugs, no problem, right? Just prior to this pinnacle period, in 1969, 8 billion stimulant pills were produced per year in the United States. But after Nixon's speech, this number went down to only 400 million in the coming years. And remember our German-American feel-good doctors from earlier? Both were unsurprisingly stripped of the right to practice medicine in 1975, putting a public end to their vitamin shots. There is, however, another chemical we need to map into our timeline to fully understand how we arrived at the ADHD drug options that we have today. Introducing methylphenidate. The stimulant doctors most often prescribe to children with ADHD today. It was first synthesized in 1944 in Switzerland and taken to the masses in 1954 under the brand name Ritalin. You'll find two stories of why this name was chosen. The first being that Ritalinic acid is the major metabolite of methylphenidate and the second being that the Swiss chemist who first synthesized it was trying to come up with a drug that he could administer to his wife to help her tennis game and keep her weight down. Her name was Marguerite, but went by Rita, inspiring the name Ritalin. Regardless of its name's origin, the purpose was to create a compound to rival amphetamine and skip around its increasingly worsening reputation. Similar to benzodrine sulfate, it came in a pill format, and at first it was used to treat chronic fatigue and depression but soon proved effective in improving symptoms of ADHD. The pills were tested rigorously within schools and soon found the nickname Maths Pills due to their concentration enhancements. So you think I have ADD or...? We won't know that until the Ritalin helps this concentration problem. Methylphenidate has emerged under various brand names over the years. It controlled the ADHD treatment space. That is, until 1996. 
Obitrol, the diet pill and amphetamine of choice of Andy Warhol we previously encountered, had been used in a few recent cases to also help patients with ADHD. An entrepreneurial opportunity emerged. Richwood Pharmaceuticals tweaked and relaunched the drug to directly target the widespread and growing number of ADHD cases. A new name was required, but that part was simple. Obitrol became ADD all, Adderall. Amphetamines were back. Girls, time for your Adderall. You know. So let's take a look at what's on offer for ADHD patients today. Among others, there are two main groups of psychostimulants that if taken in appropriate doses can provide relief to ADHD symptoms. Fortunately, they're both ones we've just learned a little about already. The groups are amphetamine and methylphenidate-based compounds, both of which act on the central nervous system to enhance levels of dopamine and norepinephrine to enhance focus, motivation and mood. To keep a long list of chemical and brand names simple, under the base chemical amphetamine, we have brands such as Dexedrine, Adderall and Vyvanse. And under the chemical methylphenidate, we have Ritalin and Concerta. Now each of these brand names have different strains, release schedules and substrains. Neither one is better than the other, and prescriptions are given differently depending on where you are in the world, how old you are, and what your current situation is. These are all prescription medications, and make up only a few of the options available for ADHD treatment. I myself don't have any opinions concerning whether people should take them or not, and I'm certainly not here to hand out medical advice. So let's look at the facts. What's the hype? Laser-like focus, alertness, increased tolerance to pain, better reaction time, euphoria, tackle boring tasks, motivation surge, more deliberate and methodical, weight loss, impulse control, fight fatigue. But also, more irritable, not as funny, insomnia, loss of appetite, anxiety, depression, headaches, and eventually, fatigue. All of these are associated effects of taking stimulants. It's worth pointing out that no drugs come with side effects. They're all simply effects. And depending on whether you're trying to sell them or restrict their usage, you may choose to talk about some effects more than others. There's no doubt that the drugs prescribed today to kids and adults who legitimately have ADHD can provide help and can change their lives for the better. But what happens when a university or college student with ADHD starts to make a little bit of money from selling their prescribed Adderall or Ritalin to their friends who don't have ADHD? And what happens when professionals looking for an edge over their colleagues fake the intangible symptoms of ADHD to their doctor for a legal stimulant prescription? Well, we've already witnessed the results. Why would we expect them to be any different in the present day? 43% of young people in the US take a form of ADHD stimulation medication without a diagnosis or prescription. This is called drug diversion, where prescription drugs are distributed illegally by those with a prescription to those without. And knowing the demands of a competitive schooling system, can we be surprised that students are turning to performance enhancing options? We've seen evidence of this abuse on college campuses as far back as 1937 in articles by Time and the New York Times. What we're seeing now is nothing new. I'm not giving my baby any more dangerous drugs. From now on, it's nothing but fresh air, lots of hugs, and good old-fashioned Ritalin. You said a mouthful. When I can't stop fiddling, I just takes me Ritalin. If the pressure mounts high enough, individuals without control will make a rational, and short-term biased decisions. Long and boring tasks to complete? Here's something to get you through. Can't bring yourself to start an essay? Have some instant motivation. Stress and worries building up? Take this to blur them into the background of your mind. Simulant drugs offer relief, an opportunity for those at their limits to regain control. The ability to boost your cognitive function speaks very deeply to us. With more on-demand power between our ears, we imagine being able to achieve our wildest dreams and diminish our greatest fears. The negative effects get pushed to the side, forgotten. The risk or cost is always sidelined by the lust for a godlike mind. Interestingly, however, the smart drugs that students are taking for a boost in their cognitive abilities for their exams and while studying might not have the effect on their brains that they think it does. 
Martha Farah, a cognitive neuroscience at the University of Pennsylvania, has created multiple placebo studies in students, showing that Adderall has little to no effect on memory, restraint, or creativity. She noted that the students were convinced that the drugs were helping them, but this did not show itself in their work. The students might have boosted their motivation, the ability to do monotonous tasks for longer, and even the ability to stay up later, but they're certainly not unlocking anything new inside of their brain. The scary reality of what's happening inside the brain is quite different. Long-term use of amphetamines and methamphetamines can have brutal consequences on brain receptors. Switching off from the drugs, once you've decided the negatives outweigh the positives, can be incredibly difficult. The specific neural receptors that are affected are called catecholamines, popularly shortened to CATS by author Julia Ross. The group includes dopamine, norepinephrine and epinephrine. The last two are more commonly known as noradrenaline and adrenaline. These CATs work together to control systems like our emotions, physical movement and motivation. The CATs are key to obtaining the desired results from taking stimulant drugs we've covered, such as focus, feeling good and impulse suppression. The drugs work by increasing the number of these CATs, in particular, dopamine. Basically, these drugs boost our cat chemicals within our brains and central nervous systems to manipulate our emotions, attention, and motivation. And they're good at it. The long-term concerning problem is found at the cat receptors. We all have a base level of these natural chemicals operating within us, but when they are boosted to artificially high levels by drugs, the receptors that protect them become overwhelmed. The brain tries to compensate for this by stripping away its receptors to protect itself. Consequently, with a reducing number of receptors, the drugs become less and less effective over time. So the potency or frequency of the source needs to be increased to replicate the original experience and reward. In the worst abuse cases, the search for euphoria is never ending. Going cold turkey is so agonizing due to the lack of dopamine receptors and a subsequent inability to experience any sort of reward. Despite individuals overcoming incapacitating addictions and the newer field of neuroplasticity coming to light, there is still much debate over whether the cat receptors can really ever fully recover after such abuse. So if we've learned time and time again that these drugs can offer short-term gains for the individual taking them, but inevitably, they become destructive. Why do we keep inviting them back into our lives? Yes, these are Schedule II controlled substances, but when you look at the numbers, the legal and illegal distribution of these drugs is only moving in one direction. One thing we should take a moment to consider together is, which large powers are actually incentivized to reduce the spread of these stimulant drugs? Why would financial institutions want their staff off the drugs if they're performing better? Why would pharmaceutical companies want to reduce their increasing profits? Why would the doctor prescribing such medications not take the money for delivering what the patient is requesting? Why would governments and councils want to question a drug that is helping already stretched school teachers control their growing classrooms? In 1990, 600,000 school children in the US were prescribed stimulants. In 2011, that number went up to 3.5 million. ADHD medication is one of the most studied among psychological drugs because it's been so thoroughly tested in so many school children for so long. And it's clear why a teacher in a school faced with hyperactive, inattentive kids would welcome any respite from a drug to calm their unruly classrooms down. With education budgets in the US and UK barely keeping up with inflation, cuts to teaching and learning support staff hours are only getting worse. We'd truly be in a troubled place if schools were promoting measures that would calm down classrooms as a result of stretched resources and tight budgets, right? Author, physician, and childhood development expert Gabor Mate in his book Scattered Minds warns that being entirely inappropriate for schools to measure parents to having their children medicated. He also references a 1998 article by Professor Paradis from Quebec University, whom two decades ago reported the anti-correlation between the reduction in number of education workers and the increase in Ritalin consumption. I say this neither to blame teachers or parents, but merely to point out the danger of a system that stretched to its limits. The actual impact of ADHD medication on young children, if monitored correctly, is very positive. It can and often does offer immediate improvements for the child and their family. It will help with symptoms and can help both children and adults cope with an increasingly difficult lifestyle. But there's something inside me that fears 
that were repeating history's stimulant cycle. The British military stopped amphetamine use after World War II because of its health concerns, and Nixon poured millions of wasted cash into fighting public enemy number one for a reason. Today, we are again faced with a ramping of stimulant use and abuse across many domains in the UK and US. Should there not be more concern? Maybe the fight is futile, and the draw to perceived performance-enhancing stimulants is simply a part of our striving culture. If that is the case, the groups who produce, prescribe, and peddle the product will always pull the strings. In just under a century, we have rinsed and repeated the same drugs under new names for different purposes, with only one real tangible outcome, abuse. The only thing for sure is that humans by nature are highly susceptible to the influence of these drugs. Whether they're obtained legally or not, there will always be a perceptually salient reason for their use. War, hedonism, creativity, or focus. In her book on ADHD, Your Brain's Not Broken, Tamara Rosier emphasized passionately that pills don't teach skills. There are more options for an individual with ADHD symptoms to use instead of or accompanying medication to really treat the core of the problem. Come along with me now as we look at the options to treat ADHD without medication. They won't be what you're expecting, and in many cases, they can be used by anyone, ADHD or not, to improve their focus. My name's Lewis McSporn. If you've enjoyed this video, please subscribe to my Brilliant Brain channel. Hit like, and I'll see you shortly in the next video.